We talked about this workshop uh, and the thematic came after an uh, exchange of emails with Gianluca uh, that I welcome and I will present in a few minutes. And uh, he said, I am a specialist, specialist in cascading events and uh, blackouts and uh, uh, organizational resilience. And I said, oh, it's incredible because we had a, an outage for three weeks in our region for 300,000 people. The military came in to give uh, su uh, supplementary generators and all that. So we were in the middle of it. And so beyond the newspaper analysis, beyond the popular analysis, how, what can we say about this, about organizational resilience, big uh, extreme events, and resilience, but more, but more than that, how do you study that? Because this was in October, and nobody is studying the organizational dynamics, institutional dynamics, the people dynamics, and how they recovered. Of course, the insurance came in, but only for a small amount. So this, this was the challenge. And I invited Elshan Tavar, she's a colleague from the uh, Risk Observatory, an expert and a specialist in, uh, uh, among other things, climate change. And uh, he, he is in a board of a lot of entities that I will present in a minute. So this is the challenge. So I will present uh, Gianluca Pescaroli. Uh, thank you for coming. He's a lecturer in business continu continuity and organizational resilience in, in the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, and, he, and also faculty of maths and physical science in University College London. And he's a specialist. I have seen some of his conference and comments uh, on uh, cascading events. He has published with David uh, Alexander and alone, of course, and also in the organizational resilience. Uh, I can say myself. A rising star <laughs> in this field is a professor since a reader, a, a reader no, as a lecturer uh, since uh, October in the University College of London. Thank you, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you to you for inviting me. I will present also El Chantavar, uh, Professor El Chantavar in Portuguese. And, um, uh, he uh, is a professor de Faculdade de Ciência e Tecnologia da Universidade de Coimbra, professor associado. Como sabem, alguns e algumas aqui na sala têm trabalhado nas questões do risco, sustentabilidade, é um especialista em ordenamento do território e transformação do uso do sol. A sua base é a geologia, mas já, já lhe digo que ela é mais social do que eu. É investigador do, do OSIRIS, do, do Centro de Estudos Sociais. É o diretor do Departamento de Ciências da Terra e faz parte, e é importante para percebermos hoje, do painel científico da Estratégia Nacional de Adaptação às Alterações Climáticas e da Plataforma Nacional para a Redução das Catars. In a few words, he is a PhD in Geology and a associate professor in the Faculty of Science and Technology. He is a member of the Center for Social Studies Risk Observatory. He is the director of the Department of Earth Sciences, a member of the National Scientific Panel for, strategic, for uh, Climate Change uh, strategic analysis and also a member of a national platform for the reduction of catastrophes. So, uh, welcome to both of you and push Irem Gentrais me circuli. Estejam à vontade se não perguntarem hoje. If you don't ask today, you will have to wait for Gianluca to come back to ask and Professor Alexandre. So, Gianluca, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank, thank, you. Yours, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the amazing introduction. Okay. Whatever, if you have uh, any question, even in a month from now, just check uh, my PowerPoint. You have uh, my email exactly here and at the end. Or just wrote Cascading Disasters on Google, you will find my mail uh, pretty easily. So, a bit of my background. Uh, I started my doctorate in 2014 uh, with David, working on a big European project on cascading events. The name was named Fortress. Uh, at the time, uh, the concept of cascading was mostly associated to critical infrastructure failures, so like energy infrastructure that was causing communication infrastructure, etc. Uh, what we did in our research is contextualizing a bit better what the, was the implication for emergency planning and what web technological disruption could imply for uh, the process of disaster management. We were lucky enough to be supported by uh, the UCL Knowledge Exchange Grant, and we founded in 2016 a research group on cascading disasters, in which we started collaborating uh, with uh, colleagues, for example, from space physics. And we had the chance to connect much better with local authorities. Uh, our institute was vital for supporting this process because they gave us the trust uh, to create something completely new in terms of the interdisciplinary process. Uh, during my doctoral degree, uh, I started a collaboration with London Resilience, that is a 
the team in charge of uh, sharing information and coordinating emergencies for the London Authority. And we started to develop a collaboration that is still ongoing and is bringing to new collaboration like with the government, with BASE, uh, that is in charge of energy resilience and innovation, as well as uh, with other institutional uh, bodies like public health team. In 2017, uh, we wrote uh, some guidelines on national risk assessment for the United Nations. And finally, last year, we published a special issue on cascading in Davis Journal. This was done uh, thanks to the collaboration with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and the colleagues there. So what I present today is part of a process that uh, started in 2014 and is still ongoing. So we are still evolving the ideas and the more collaboration we are doing, the more we are relating with other experts in other fields, the more we are coming up with new solutions, new ideas, and new challenges. So, my goals today, I will introduce uh, briefly the concept of cascading. Uh, I will apply to black cascade thinking. So, what happens when the light goes down? So, in particular, uh, we will focus a bit on our experience on how to prepare to blackout and white hour power failure. Um, I will highlight some lessons learned from our research, also with the methodologies with, that we adopted, that are more on the social science, so we don't do modeling. We collaborate with people that do modeling, we don't do that, we are doing other things. We work on business continuity, organizational resilience, David is working on emergency planning, and I'm still learning from him, possibly for other 10 years or so. But we can convey different expertise on the same understanding. Um, I will point out some suggestions, and as you had uh, here, as I was saying, a great chance to create a new case study, I will propose some path ahead for collaboration to learn from your own experience and contextualize the research on preparedness to power failure in Cascadian events based on what you have here. Uh, it's a bit, when we are facing this issue, sometimes I feel a bit like the elephant. It's uh, very complex, and I often end up with an headache at the end of the day. I will uh, explain why this happens basically all the time. What we learned, the key lesson learned, you will find that PowerPoint in all my presentation, is that when we start doing research, and when I started to do research, the context was completely different. And emergency planning is completely different than when it was 20 years ago. So think about your life in academia. When I started the university, no Google Scholar, no email. Well, it was not so, so crazy time ago, it was 2002. Uh, but it was not so used to uh, flight from a country to a country like we did this weekend. Uh, I'm actually married with a Georgian woman, and if that was not possible, if there were not cheap flights. Uh, my life is dependent by the battery of my laptop. And if I don't look the email every single day, I'm basically, I don't know what to do. My job is stuck. Think about how your life is different from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and what is now. Which are your priorities? This is changing also the way we have to conceive disaster management and contingency plan. Before, it was all that. If we take as a joke the pyramid of meat, is the what we have in terms of food and services, the shelter, the food, the water. But sometimes now, those are dependent on all that. Because the chain of supply can be, the be dependent on global trotting, on international connection and global logistics, like what is happening with the UK with Brexit for planning for no deal. Well, you are importing 30% of food from the European Union. You are depending on energy supply, because whatever you do, you are based on data sets that are online and on things that you need electricity to run. And you need a connection because communication is fast. And everything we are doing and the exchange we have is just in time economy. So all that in terms of organizational resilience of organizations or management, everything is different. The life in the university, in life in academia is different than even just 10 years ago. So which are the implications for plans, continuity and strategies? So uh, we ended up with this definition on cascading disaster in 2014-15, where we understood simply that it's not just the primary impact the problem. It's not the water of the flood, the earthquake, but is what is coming up next. 
It's the chain of network and consequences that determine those secondary impact and escalation point. So what comes up next? Think about somebody punch you, instead of being focused on the punch, is the problem that comes when the punch arrives to the backbone of the shoulders. You can fall down, but it's not the punch itself. It's the vertebra. It's what happens next. And if you look carefully all these kind of problems, there are always vulnerabilities that were there and were not addressed. Um, one of the key determinants uh, in all this process, in particular in this presentation, is thinking about the impact on critical infrastructure. So, for example, electricity. Uh, this can be expressed in this way. So we are used to think normally to disasters, events, and planning in this way. So a, a sequential linear cause-effect. Instead, what we see in complex event, in cascading, we have the trigger event, but what are the secondary emergency the escalate, and which is the center of the problems in terms of deployment, or in ter and what can be the critical element that have to be addressed in planning. Maybe it's not the flooding, because we don't live in a floating area, but all the infrastructure we are depending on are in a floating area, and our problem is the loss of services. So, the, as I was saying, those nodes, those points that can escalate, can be determined by critical infrastructure. Uh, this is a standard definition you can find. You can find a lot of definition. If you have doubts, there is a website named cypedia.eu, supported by European Project, that collect nearly 58 of it. Anyway, the key is that these infrastructure are the essential to economic and social well-being, public safety, and key governmental function. So are those buildings or services for which you maintain society as you know it? Think about you're taking out your mobile now. Critical infrastructure is all what is allowing your mobile to go, to, to function, and the emergency services to come to help you if you try to call them. So the failure of critical infrastructure can escalate secondary emergencies, as we're saying. Uh, think about uh, a network not going, ATM not working, or even the emergency facilities that are not operational, a gone command that, that is stuck, or a police station that is not working in a certain time on a certain day. And this has implications for businesses, enterprises. Uh, if we think, my, I come from an area that is uh, rich of uh, enterprises, and it was considered like a model for the cluster nation, is a media reminder, small, lot of small, medium enterprises. But think about infrastructure in a situation like that that goes down. One bridge that goes down in that area, as it happens, it can cause relapse on the economy in ter terms of billions. One bridge. Uh, there are two ways that this happens. One is functional disruptions. For example, you can see on that our special issue that uh, developed a lot of this topic. So how, what happens uh, if a communication goes down, electricity goes down, and which are the interdependencies? And the other one is the generation of new hazards, such as, for example, uh, Natech events, all the work that the Silvet Krausman in the JRC. So those hazards that come up uh, from, for example, a biological system that goes down, sewer system that polluted the area, or a chemical plant that goes down. Uh, this is one of the ways to represent uh, the energy sector. So you have electricity power and power supply on which everything else is dependent from transportation, emergency service, and governmental service. This was one of the first illustrations of that, dated back to 2005. And this is very common to find. Another version of that, that is done by the colleagues of the London Authority, is what it looks like. So the central electricity failure and the cross effect that it caused. So you see, you go out and the impacts are different. You go from something basic like uh, effect on nursery, healthcare, uh, impact in water, and then to wider community. And all the chain in the community that can be affected in terms of dependence of equipment, in terms of challenges for communication, etc. So this report is of free online, feel free to check it. And the key problem in all that is that for understanding that often, you have to have people that communicate it in the infrastructure sector. And it's not always what happens. On the, on the opposite side, they normally do not communicate. Uh, black side is thinking. 
in all that, we are used to think that uh, our system is higher reliable. We don't consider the infrastructure can go down until when it goes down, like what you had here into the, into, uh, last year. You remember the picture I show of the strange dog with the chicken? We are used to think that the strange dog is super quiet, reliable, but what if somebody throws a ball? So, our reliability cannot go down without understanding the power of coincidence and the fact that when we speak with policymakers, often low probability is considered something else. Low probability, who cares? We don't have to think about it. Or if you speak with somebody in an industry, say low probability, okay? My problem is that I'm flooding every two months. But a big discussion is that make understand people that low probability does not imply that it cannot happen, happen tomorrow. Uh, everybody of you can uh, have experienced a lot of couple of worst case scenarios lately. And always, the problem is not the first trigger. The problem is the contextualization of the event. Which are the vulnerabilities of the local levels? What David was talking this morning. Which are the drivers that can escalate the problem? Consider my flow. If something can go wrong, it can go wrong. But it can also go, go, go worse. <laughs> so this was a photo from New York and Katrina. It's like just fire in the middle of a flooding due to electricity failure. Uh, so let's make a test, fast test, to make understand the problem. So, who experienced a blackout in this room? Everybody of you? Everybody was uh, part of the 2000? Perfect. Another question. How many of you have uh, an old school radio battery at home? Not the one in, uh, not the one in smartphone, do not cheat. Three, four? I didn't have it before I doing this with this work. I completely... <laughs> I started to be more like, oh my god, I don't have a radio that is working at all with battery. I just have my, lap, my, my mobile. But so how you're going to get the emergency advice if you don't have the radio and the phone is down? Who has a working landline? Mobile is taking the place everywhere. Working landline is a backup if you have a communication failure, like a, the old kind of old school mobile phone that is much more resilient than mobile phones. Uh, are you still using cash? How many people? <laughs> I'm the old guy. Oh, you're still using it? Oh, yeah, Portugal is more similar to Italy. If you were in London, nobody. Or Brazil. No, yeah. <laughs> no cash at all. <laughs> Just ATM. But, so every single of this answer has implication for planning, has implication for your own personal resilience in case of any kind of failure, like a power failure. Uh, the first thing that happens is that you cannot go shopping in London because uh, you know, the cash machines are all uh, integrated and you, they don't have money anymore. I, I had a photo that I forgot to put here. It was, uh, I, want, uh, I wanted to go to have shopping in Lidl. Lidl was stuck because they had a localized emergency pop failure and we had to go in another uh, place that was literally 20 minutes more from there because in <coughs> that area you could not go to shopping. Not because uh, the shop was not working, because the cash machine inside, the automatic one, not working. And the personnel, there was no any more personnel that could keep something, pay cash. Uh, so when you think, uh, all that impact organizational resilience, all that impact the way we do in business continuity and the way we keep things going in case of a disruption. Uh, again, this is a paper we published in 2008 uh, with my, our colleague of space physics. We understood that Putting together even things like cybersecurity and extreme space weather events, that are two things that normally we cannot even put together. One is geomagnetic storm, the sun, and the other one, cyber attack by the Russian. But there are common vulnerabilities and common escalation points. And some of the way we address this kind of emergency can be the same. Uh, and think about what can happen if one of these failure, like in this case, we understood that the common point of failure could be GNS, GPS, so the satellite system. So what you have in your mobile phone when you use Google Maps, or a lot of other things that nobody understands because it's hidden everywhere. It's everywhere, but it's hidden. Like, think about an ambulance that is going somewhere, GPS not working, they have not a clue where to go. What happens if emergency response has to deploy? First, they don't have a clue where they are, they, uh, they have to deploy. And all like that, so complexity has to be integrated in plan. And in other words, think about that. 
again, this is higher reliability. We hit the infrastructure. We think the infrastructure is there, but then we fall down because we did anything great that in our plan B. So what is what are the specific of why our power failures and blackout? So there is a nice study promoted by Public Health England that explains how much, despite the fact that we think that power failure are not common, they are extremely common. Uh, the study highlighted that in uh, 2013, in the first three months, there were 52 power outages in 19 countries, so everywhere. And uh, they are starting to integrate them in a risk register, like this one is the London risk register, uh, where a major impact, a total shutdown in electricity supply in Greater London is considered moderately clue, but major impact. But uh, 24 hours. But what happens when we consider, like, for example, a black start event, so a major disruption of the grid where we have to restart from zero? Think about your own experience here in 2018. Which were the lessons learned? Are, or there were any lessons learned, or they're still thinking, oh, this happened once, won't happen a second time? So there are many challenges for planning. First, it's difficult to visualize all the effects on predatory action. So, we are thinking about something extremely complex. When you think about electricity communication, you still think, okay, what am I going to do if electricity goes down? If you're starting to look seriously what are the implications, you start to get stuck at after a bit because every single thing we are doing is dependent on that, as you experience probably during the blackout. Uh, you can say, okay, I can go anyway to make my dinner with gas, and but then if you're cooking a pasta, maybe the water is not working in your sink. And if you have meat in the fridge, maybe the fridge is not working and the meat is becoming a nasser. And these liars, when you are thinking about realities like London, Port, Lisbon, the res overall resilience of the area, or the urban area and the context goes down immediately because the technological dependence is so high and the necessity to prioritize becomes so complex that is the same emergency service starts to look around, okay, we are aware that these things can all go down, but which is your key list? What we have to do, what we have to post first, second, third, and how we allocate our resources. Uh, then there is another problem, uh, budget cuts. Don't know here in Portugal, in everywhere else in Europe, budget cuts, so it means that emergency services are less and uh, less resources. Uh, if they were used to have uh, like a certain amount of tons of bunk fuel in the police station and uh, fire station or even hospitals, half of it maybe. Uh, and another thing that I understood preparing this presentation is that sometimes when you start to face scenarios like uh, uh, the Black Star, people go mad. Well, we knew that already when we were looking at that in London, when we started to do gap analysis, but uh, if you look at that power failure you will see uh, in the last three months, uh, you have started to be prepared for a black start event and there are anonymous that is saying, oh, they are starting to plan uh, and they want to create a total power failure because and blame it on Chinese and somebody else is saying, oh, oh my God, they are doing that what they are hiding. Uh, no, it's simply that it's realistic, the infrastructure is old and it can happen then, there are cyber threats, etc. But Let's make some example of which are the implications for deployment. Well, you all know the triple event in Japan, right? Earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima. We already talked about it uh, yesterday. But what our research showed in 2017 uh, is that uh, there are implications in terms of direct effect of Fukushima, not for international relief. So failure of power plant means lack of energy, means that the, there is a peak of demand, you know, the case studies we analyze of meals ready to eat and demand of water bottles. You know, and this can become so overwhelming that we have to deal with international relief to do that. Plus, indirect effect. In this case, there was a nuclear power plant, so there was contamination need for training and those geometers. So when you think about black start event, it's not just the light going down, it's which are the implications of the infrastructure going down and everything that comes up in terms of secondary emergency and how to integrate in our plan some of these aspects, so that's the most critical. Again, hurricane Sandy, hurricane, storm surge, but uh, concurrence, so there was a cold wave, 
and there was an indirect number of life losses associated with that uh, during the cold wave. Then there was that, but this is a peak. This is something related to 2005 that has been uh, photoshopped. So if you're seeing that in some presentation, I was using it again, then I discovered it was a fake. What it was looking like was that. Uh, many urban areas were having spot. This is, I think, New York, where there were some areas completely uh, stuck. So think if you were lucky enough to be in one of the elevators, and you were there for hours, and think about all the small shops there, which were their business continuity plan in case of power failure, where they were throwing the food that was going bad because of weather, or expiring date, or refrigeration, and think about how you put uh, water in a high rise without the pump working. These are all things that have to be considered in planning, and they make the difference for organizational resilience. But if you are a private, and if you are an emergency responder. And then there was that. So there was a national emergency declared because there was not energy and there was not anywhere kind of fluid. So, you may have experienced something like that in 2019. Other example, uh, Puerto Rico, September 2017. In this case, the impact of life losses has been already proved, not quantified, but proved, because simply hospitals are not working. No electricity, hospitals are not working. And it's still ongoing, because it's not still so, it will take years to go back. But the life expectancy already goes down. And another final example. Well, when you think uh, that this thing not happen, again, worst case scenario, we are pessimists, uh, we, have, we become paranoid because we are working in this sector. No, not true. In 2017 in Italy, 150,000 uh, families were without electricity for a snowfall. But even in this case, the problem is that there were all the small villages, it was not a major urban area, but if you don't have people that are trained, you can send the military, but if the military does not have a clue what they have to prioritize, prioritize or they don't have enough generator, or they don't have the training for the people to have the generator in every single village, how do you manage that? And it went on because it was not a first thing plan. And again, this is not just the case of Italy, okay, we do things in, I mean, in our own way, but in this case, think about the difference with your own experience. Which could be the common point between all that? Which could be the common experience, the common lesson learned? So our personal experience with the London Authority, uh, when I was finishing my doctorate, we activated the knowledge exchange uh, project with them, with the London Resilience Team. I was lucky enough to be for some time, so that's once a week at the London Fire Brigade, trying to sort out something with the team. So first we had uh, a questionnaire that makes the what quantitative methods and some open questions uh, to derive qualitative evidence about uh, the perception of cascading in the partnership. The London Resilience Partnership is more or less 170 organizations. Uh, we had uh, more or less uh, 60 answers to questions, and it's quite a, a good, uh, good result. But the evidence shows that uh, there was a high perception of cascading risk, but they were all aware that there was no integration in policy nor guidelines for emergency planning and management. So, uh, there was again uh, highlighted that there was the need for training and there were two tools that were preferred by stakeholders. Free guidelines that they could read in five minutes and integration in scenario. So we did that. Yes. Uh, we released uh, together with the authorities some guidelines to support the training and situational awareness of emergency operators and to try to help them be there to build uh, some better scenarios and to give situational awareness in case of emergency. I left some of the copies of that uh, to Zuzia earlier. And then in the second moment, we derived the gap analysis. So we tried to understand where the London Authority was less prepared and the London stakeholders were less prepared to manage the emergency. Uh, this is more or less what it looks like. So we have a power failure. Uh, independently of cascading drivers or compounding drivers, we have direct effects to life, indirect threats to life, and general challenges for personal capacity. So the report is also available on our website or prevention web, but I left some hard copy here if you want to look at it. So we see that as direct uh, threats to life, we have health issues, hygiene, uh, contamination, traffic disruption, 
And as I was saying, citizen trapped. Think about how many firefighters requires to save somebody in a, trapped in a lifter in a high rise. And then such economical disruption. Uh, think about you're going to pay to the ATM and the ATM is not working, you don't have cash, so your food storage at home is nothing. And think about people with dialysis, for example, or other vulnerable population where the, there's the need of persistent uh, healthcare or something dependent on electricity. And changing your working condition. So how am I supposed to go to work uh, if I have to commute and the train is not working because there is a blackout? Uh, how is uh, a major industry organized to keep the operation uh, going? Uh, is, for example, a medium-large business developing a procedure with the key personnel to maintain the lifeline operational capacity, not to have bankrupt? And then, uh, in some cases like this one, emergency responders and emergency planners are the first victims. Uh, there was evidence in 1998 in Auckland, uh, there was, a, or in New Zealand, anyway, there was a long power failure heat, during a heat wave. But the emergency services were in a nice building without moving, without opening windows, so they were stuck. And the operational capacity was supposed to go down for the stress level of prolonged deployment, and because it was terribly hot and they could not open the window. So there is a loss of efficiency that you have to put in, in the process. And procurement logistics, again, it's just in time economy, everybody has budget cut, which are the implications. Uh, we included uh, in the checklist some points, like uh, very basic sometimes, like are you considering uh, the vulnerabilities uh, in the area? Uh, do you have a, 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 a exercise to identify your priorities and lifelines on that? Uh, and something uh, very practical and basic, uh, once the internet goes down, do you have a paper based uh, backup? Or are we completely reliable on technology? Uh, one thing that happened in the last years is also that even in emergency services, the old generation that knew how to go to admin old way, now they are retired. And all the, the new generation, I was lucky enough to be in the middle, even because in Italy, internet connection arrived so much later. But how you shift from a high technological intensive procedure to something that is back to basics. Uh, and again, uh, the problem is that we have to be realistic sometimes. And we tend not to be realistic. So in terms of business continuity, uh, this is very clear if we start to understand the organizational awareness, uh, which could be the vulnerability of society. But, uh, the thing is that uh, we are used to think, okay, just in time economy, we have a contract for a generator, this will serve anything. When we have the need, the contractor will come with the generator. But what we know for sure in London is that for every, let's say, X number of contracts, there is one generator, and that generator is possible that at the moment of need is in Saudi Arabia or something like that in deployment. So if we don't test these kind of things in procurement, and in the business continuity process, well, we could actually understand that we don't have the generator or that the person who was habilitated to use it is stuck at home because it was commuting from another town. So again, in terms of organizational resilience, the implication of blackout is try to put complexity into something easy. That means which are the lifelines that we have to keep operational capacity on and organizational capacity where we can plan for that and which action, even the basic one, we can undertake. So very fast before my time is run out. Uh, we did also a gap analysis uh, for the preparedness of power failure in, in a strategic workshop where uh, London Resilience provided complementary qualitative evidence on that. Uh, we had 26 valid questionnaires with a cross check with 20 follow up of senior critical infrastructure and uh, Managers, so it was something that if we were not working with them, we had no access to. We investigated general perception of power failure in cascading and planning, response to recovery, and how to improve organizational resilience. So, results uh, is not open to the public. Sorry, we can talk <laughs> in it when uh, the figure is out. But uh, I can do some uh, 
general lesson learned from that and the other review of literature uh, we did. So the first point is that, uh, well, even if we think that, uh, according to what I just saw, uh, you should think, okay, why not everybody has a plan for a blackout? It's so common. No, that is not what is happening. And despite the fact that risk registers are increasing the relevance of power failure and other technological events, we are still thinking in the old way. So it's not prioritized enough. There is a lack of understanding what the public needs and how to communicate with them. Uh, when I started to do this research, I asked to my, one of my flatmates at the time, it was a very nice 24 years old Lithuanian girl, okay, so how you're gonna take your information in London if your mobile goes down? I saw her face panicking. I grew up without internet, so I knew that in go to an institutional presence, so to police station to get the information what to do and eventually if I had to guide somewhere else or coordinate something. But this is a huge deal in particular in city like think about Porto, think about Lisbon, think about everywhere there are a lot of tourists, how to communicate to the public, which could be the difference between a high urban area or like the center of Portugal. Which are the practice of communication in a situation like that that could be activated? So, which are the needs that we should give priority to? How can we keep communication with the vulnerable categories like, again, elderly, people with dialysis, or even just uh, people with special needs? And the other thing is that uh, the cascading effects of power failure are often seen self-standing and we are not even trying to understand what is electricity meaning for the other sector? So I focus on the lamp not working, but I don't consider the communication that is not working at the same time and transportation that is not working at the same time. And again, this has huge implication for business continuity because I can prioritize which are the key personnel that I need to be to have on place on the day, who can telework, or which are the key logistic assets that they need to keep operational at all costs, if it were anything like that, while in the other case is chaos and a risk bankrupt. Or in case of emergency service, I don't deliver the service. Because uh, you're in central London, nobody can afford accommodation, so you have, don't have anybody of the Met Police in certain areas, or you have, don't have civil servant in the office because they will commute. To sum up, well, we experienced the cascading in our complex event. We cannot focus just on the tree. Uh, sometimes we don't have to look for a complex solution to complex challenges. Here we have to go to basic. We have to detach what we have to do. So simply start to define a series of procedures that can be done with low touch technological intensity. Simply maybe having all the key emergency number of line on paper having the key procedure of line on paper and the list of people, what they're doing, where they are on paper. And then we have to exercise that with scenarios that integrate those aspects and possibly find other solution and start to buy, like I did, uh, a hand cracker for uh, charging the mobile with a writer <laughs> and keeping home some cash. Area of possible collaboration. Uh, I found it very, very interesting to understand your experience here in Portugal for 2008. So, uh, we are trying to do some work about how to adapt policies and plan, but the, my question is how can we learn something from your own experience? You have potential data sets here. We can do that quite easily adapting the questionnaire we already did, or evolving that integrating mixed method, for example. Uh, there are some questions I have and I wanted to develop with the fire brigade that we never followed up for because at the time uh, there were three terrorist attacks uh, and it was a very complex period for them and for me. Uh, but how power failure can affect behaviors and households? How the period you had on blackout changed the behavior in the household, which were the plan B to which who shifted and in, were there any differences between the areas? Potentially you can use the experience you have here to test of that. That is terrible for what happened, but it can be a great element to get new lessons. Another thing that 
Well, we can potentially even, even think to elaborate the guidelines we did already, translate it in Portuguese, and adapt it to your own experience and put it free uh, of our online uh, awesome prevention web again. That could be another thing that could be useful also in Brazil, for example. That could be another thing if local authorities are interested. That's a very easy way to help. And forthcoming, we will release very soon uh, another report uh, on GNS and GPS failure done with the government. Uh, we did a couple of workshops on that uh, in London, the last one, uh, the, Royal, uh, the Royal Society. And again, it's not the trigger here. GNS is a hidden uh, infrastructure, but we can see that there could be power failure from that. In some way, I'm not a technical, I don't have a clue what, but what I'm going to tell to the people who are reading my guidelines is that you have to plan also for a minimum disruption of services related to electricity. So let's define together some other things that can be done in that sector and explore a bit what you have here. How can we collaborate and what, how can we drive something new? Again, uh, our website, uh, I'm going to change it a bit in the next weeks because we have a, uh, our institute just released a completely new website. So just please check the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. And our special issue, and get in touch in any moment uh, at my email. So I think my time is run over. Looking forward to have a chat with you during the day. OK, thank you. So I'm going to talk in Portuguese. Have uh, just a small introduction about what I'm going to talk. Um, as uh, my colleague Jose Manuel mentioned, uh, I've been working on national uh, agenda for uh, climate change adaptation. And it was surprising, uh, dealing with all the discussion, uh, to see all the, um, all the focus about uh, the sectoral adaptation and not uh, um, a broad adaptation and the discussion about what are the focus, how can we, make, how can we have um, inter, inter, um, interoperability of the, the actions. So uh, I spent uh, three months reading the abstracts and the conclusions about the EU uh, projects, ERGC, uh, Horizon, Interrex, a lot, trying to have a, some focus about what could be our dimension for Portugal and what could be the, uh, the key questions about climate change, adaptations. I'm not worried about uh, mitigation. I'm not worried right now on mitigation measures. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, focused on adaptation, what it could be an agenda for Portugal, namely for, uh, for a research agenda. So uh, I'm going to share with, uh, with all of you some points that uh, I, 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 I discovered and it was, it was a long discussion with some colleagues and okay. So um, the, this is my, my, my purpose. And uh, okay, uh, maybe I, I change for Portuguese as uh, quickly as possible. So I was surprising, and I have here a, uh, a paper from two, uh, from seven years ago uh, that have um, that point the the different problems, the different ways that we have in recent years uh, fixed this kind of uh, problems, and we, we have a, an uh, an evolution very clear, very um, from the, the policy questions. Uh, in the first generation, we are asking what what are the, the climate change problem? After, how can we manage? How can we effectively manage this? And now, uh, the, uh, the, the authors uh, present the last one. Are we seeing the benefits about this? And this is related with different stages, different levels of uh, risk assessment, and the methodological approach is changing too, and the scenarios that support this kind of evolution has a long change. 
in my point, we are right now in the sixth generation. We are not discussing if we are uh, seeing the benefits. How can we make uh, how can we make the adaptation measure more uh, flexible and recognizable for all the actors and the public? And the strategic, I think it's it's always changing, and now we are. Uh, we need a demonstration for uh, basing a deliberative approach to share and to implement this kind of adaptation. I think so. Uh, I take this to 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 promote this kind of, of open mind about what is going to happen so quickly about the uh, our way of doing the, the uh, adaptation for climate change. And uh, what is the frame about this? We have always uh, a discussion between a predictive uh, uh, way of doing this, and it's uh, based on the, um, critical thresholds, based on historical records, or in the global scenarios, so we have a top-down approach, a bottom-up approach, but uh, th th this is, this is uh, a way that we see in space and time a big difference between what we think about the future uh, uh, vulnerability thresholds and that the PCC has always the need to have different scenarios and different approaches for both of the scenarios. So uh, we are always dealing of different kinds of options. And from the core uh, the standard approach and one it's based on local approach. So uh, there are the different. And when we see, uh, when uh, when we want to have different approaches, local approaches, from the global to local, a different scale, we, have, we must have this in mind. I have here some, some, uh, some topics about this. Uh, the, the World Economic Forum clearly stated that uh, we must have no, uh, we must complement the, the mitigation uh, topics with adaptation measures, and th this is th this is uh, our dealing with the discarbonization of the society and uh, different topics is no longer uh, uh, is no longer sufficient to, to, to make this approach. And uh, uh, the PCC uh, in the last records clear. Um, recognize that we have uh, uh, some planning adaptation measures, but with limited responses uh, get. So uh, we have some, uh, we have built some, uh, some options. We, tr we try to translate this on planning, uh, framing the changes, but we don't have a sufficient uh, Response implemented. So uh, uh, the last, the last uh, one of the last records, uh, uh, clear and aligned. We have we have uh, show some incremental adjustment, but nowadays we must uh, get some implementation with more flexibility, with local approaches, for instance and uh, based on learning process, involving people with a more deliberative process and with, uh, with this kind of, of approaches. As mentioned before, uh, Sendai framework uh, clear um, stated that the population affected is, is a focus and the losses and the critical infrastructure are there too. Are essential to increase their, their resilience. One, one, the, uh, one topic that's clear in all the, in all the records and, and the framework about this is the implement of new technolog technological options, try to frame some uh, scientific policy interfaces, 
not only on the climate science, but on, on the adaptations. And try, and try to get some uh, su uh, supply chain interruptions, access to goods and, uh, and resources, anticipated uh, the, the emergency. So uh, try to, to, to build a more integrative approach, not a, a sectoral approach. And the, the, the EU agenda about, um, about the policies uh, clearly stated that uh, the next uh, years will be focused on user and beneficiary solutions. And, uh, um, and this is the, the point for research for, for, and to public policies. And uh, this is clear. Uh, some uh, options mm -hmm. try to get these kind of approaches involved in policy makers, academia, uh, articulate interest from sectors of activity, and have uh, training and communication with individuals and communication. So this is the framework. Uh, as I, I can observe, it, we have um, some challenges from the next uh, years about the adaptation. Frame for more flexible options, more um, adaptive options at local scales, and try to get um, uh, some bridge be between policy makers, academia, and uh, in, in this kind of interactions and interest uh, based on. So um, when I when I I made this this, this point of view, I will, uh, and, and this is the framework I was organizing in Portugal, the, the climate change adaptation. There is a coordination group with a scientific panel, and it is and it, this this is a representation of the sectorial. Um, experts that uh, build the, the different option. So we have here some uh, about all of these topics, uh, point of view about agriculture, biodiversity, a uh, lot of, uh, of interest. And the discussions and the options are always framed on this kind of this uh, uh, strip, the, the skirts. Uh, um, very close options for each one. And I couldn't recognize a broad approach about this. So um, my intention is to, to, to avoid this kind of, of effort. So after three months of readings, um, uh, so uh, I bridged this, 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 this graphic. Uh, trying to frame what could be a new options for risk analysis and judgment about climate change. So uh, we, we could have, this is based on the RGC uh, statement uh, with some adaptation. So we have a generation of knowledge, we have a decision and implementation uh, actions, and uh, all, always the frame uh, from the, the previous uh, graphic is about this. Climate forces and risk assessment based on the sectors. So uh, I think it will be interesting to get different research, uh, different topics from research and scientific topics, from uh, other differences of knowledge, trying to bridge a different approach for this. So I'm going to, to present the 10 um, key questions for adaptation that, that I do to uh, take about this. And uh, first, first two uh, are based on scale. And, and this is very clear to me. So we have a local scale that uh, clear in the, the scientific literature is more close, uh, uh, close to the urban. The local has become more and more and more clear to, to the urban approach. 
and the multi-scale or the transnational local scale. So in adaptation, we have a local approach, a scale, and a transnational approach with different impacts about this. So when we, when we are dealing with health and, uh, epi epidemia or something like this, we must have a discussion with transnational uh, topics involving legal, uh, legal, as, uh, legal approach for regulatory uh, cultural framework when we're dealing about the thing or we, uh, about some, some disease, about forests or something like this. Or, as in Portugal, as we deal with uh, water, water between, uh, 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 water basin between Portugal and Spain. How can we deal with, uh, with the supply? This is a dimension, a transnational dimension, that have a, a different frame from the local based approach. So this is two topics uh, based on scale. Uh, first one very focused on individuals and groups and real-time conditions, and uh, the other one in the, um, uh, a different, uh, different scale. The third and fourth, it's based on um, planning options. Plan uh, how can I say, uh, we have long literature about um, uh, sensitive areas from uh, interface areas on cities, from coastal areas, from uh, areas with barriers or something like that. We have uh, different frames for sensitive areas or when we can recognize uh, in, uh, complex interrelations where the impacts are more or uh, with, uh, which have uh, with, uh, more impacts than in the other area. And for extreme event, uh, events are uh, extremely important. For Portugal, for instance, this is the interface of rural and cities, it's very important, and the coastal areas. And another topic that uh, I'm very clear about kind of options, it's about planning, uh, planning adaptation. So we have a discussion in Portugal about forest planning, uh, special, uh, special planning about forest, about urban, about uh, dealing uh, with new options to use the territory and the resources. And forest management is an example for diversity, for coastline planning and risk management, for dealing what master's planning. So this is a focus on planning, not in territory, but uh, we getting uh, some uh, some uh, uh, options, some ways, some tools to get to get this. Surprising, um, it was. Uh, the adaptation clear, identified uh, the rural areas as specific areas to get adaptation. And, and, and this is a not a discourse very, very polite about this. So we have uh, an areas about this kind of characteristics where uh, the adaptation measures is about soils, uh, regenerations, uh, forest, water quality and quantity, or uh, biodiversity, biodiversity, ecosystem service, something like that. So we have some strategies, clear point for rural areas, as supporting for another dimension, for instance, supporting or complementing urban areas. But the, uh, the natural resources on rural areas are um, emerging as a different topics about, about this. The six and seven, it's about, as, uh, as was mentioned before, something about uh, critical infrastructures as feedback <coughs> for uh, social 
uh, functioning in different, uh, different topics and the de developing of uh, innovative technology, namely on uh, uh, remote areas, image generator, focus, uh, getting real-time uh, real data uh, for monitoring or getting image or some getting some information for uh, air and land and water um, animate uh, vehicles or some options trying to get use a better use for resources uh, demand access or distribution for instance for food energy so th this is there is a focus on new advanced technology trying to get best uh, efficiency for uh, <coughs> for have more information or for get a good a good assess and dealing with with um, with goods and the last three one more soci more sociological approach it's one it's social vulnerability as we have here in, in says some, some credits uh, it's a, it's an emerging area with with a focus, and David Alexander stated this in the, in, in this morning. And another uh, topics, it's very close to use of uh, focus on users or beneficiaries, and this is could be um, uh, uh, stated from different approaches, from the individual and producers of uh, information for crowdsourcing, for instance, for the, now it's very common in Germany, the discussion about the, the volunteers uh, and what importance of volunteers on the uh, civil protection or the existence of contingency uh, uh, systems for individuals, for family, for instance. So, and the, the other, the other, the last one, it's about one topic that emerged very clearly. It's um, important to get trust about this kind of discourse and to get involvement. So it's the, the part uh, uh, involving the risk category, the risk discourse about this, and the communication. So, those are the topics about uh, uh, the challenge uh, for for climate adaptation. And if I put here, and this is the, the last the last slide, if I put here, and uh, if I made links for Portuguese uh, adaptation measures for the next ten years. I could recognize for Portugal four main areas for adaptation. Not sector adaptation, but four uh, dimensions for adaptation. And one is based on cities, on urban areas, where, where we have pr problems of health, problems of energy, problems of mobility, uh, problems of uh, dealing what, with water recycling. Uh, so some of the topics are very uh, uh, stressful on urban areas. The other, the other it's uh, life, uh, how can we get resources and life with uh, with all the discussions about questions about this on rural areas. With, and we, we have here a, a long discussion, how can we get uh, a balanced way of dealing with this on urban and rural areas. Another topic, it's very, it's very common, it's a long discussion about in Portugal, it's the coastal areas where, where we have three different the, the, the discourse about this, the, the academic the, the discourse about coastal areas, 
the users discuss about, uh, and the manager discuss about, about coastal areas. So uh, we must have more climate change adaptation for the, for the, uh, uh, the coastal system, a strategic and deliberative management. And this is the only way to get this kind of approach. And last one, it's very particular, not with a special uh, uh, impact, but with a, a, a frame on different magnitude of catastrophic events, where, where emergency support could be dealt with. So, uh, in my point of view, uh, if we recognize the 10 topics about what is framed about climate change for Portugal, uh, we could deal and could get uh, uh, a graphic where those topics are the main topics to get an adaptation. And this is my reflections about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.